Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'm Margaret Talkett, the producer of our American Inspiration author series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at American culture, Hollywood, and one of its first families. On your screen is the schedule for our hour long event featuring Mick Davis and his new book, Competing with Idiots, Herman and Joe Mankiewicz, a dual portrait. After a brief illustrated presentation, Mr. Davis will be joined on screen by his cousin, tonight's moderator, Ben Mankiewicz, host of Turner Classic Movies. More on them in a moment. For now, just some quick housekeeping notes. We're in a Zoom webinar format, which means that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We cannot take your comments over the chat, but do look there for some relevant links that we'll be sharing. If you have a question for tonight's guests, use the Q&A button. Many of you shared your queries in advance, but we welcome additional questions. Tonight's program is being recorded by my colleagues here at the Brew Family Learning Center. The video will be published soon on our website, and tonight's tech producer, Courtney Reardon, will Zoom email it to you when it's posted, free, accessible on the American Inspiration video archive. Of course, the real pleasure comes from reading Nick's brilliantly written book. This evening will be interesting, but the book is even better. Copies of Competing with Idiots can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Mass. You'll see on the screen their coupon code, AMINS20, which is also being placed in the chat. Use that code as you order online and you'll receive a signed book-plated copy. We are grateful for the partnership of this wonderful independent bookstore. Thank you to David Sandberg and his team. Our thanks as well to tonight's sponsor, the Substack newsletter, Ty Burr's Watchlist. Mr. Burr has been the film critic at the Boston Globe and at Entertainment Weekly. At tyburswatchlist.stack.com, he shares his keen insights on film, and as important, he helps you find streaming movies. Lucky for us, Ty is going to join our Zoom in the second half of our program at the time of the Q&A, serving up a questions of his own and also your audience questions. So we will have three film history buffs and industry pros on the screen before the night is over. Moving quickly to start, some brief words about our featured guests. Nick Davis is a writer, director, and producer. His most recent film is Once Upon a Time in Queens. It's about the 1986 Mets baseball team, Mets. Okay, Nick, we Boston Red Sox fans, we will love you anyway, Bill Buckner and all. Um, I'm moving on. Uh, Nick lives in New York, of course, with his wife and his daughters. Most important for this evening, though, he is the grandson of screenwriter Herman Mankiewicz. Now, about tonight's conversationalist, Ben Mankiewicz is also a grandson of Herman. As many of you know, he is the primetime host of Turner Classic Movies, a film critic and a journalist who's reported for CBS Sunday Morning. Ben lives in California with his wife and daughters. We'll get these cousins together in a bit, but for now, welcome Nick. I really loved your book. Um, well, I, thank and, you, Margaret. Thank you um, so much. It had such riveting stories um, and some really fabulous images of those early days in Hollywood and also of New York. And what was Herman called? He was called what the Voltaire of Central Park? He was called the Voltaire of Central Park West. Uh, of Central Park West. Okay, yes, yeah. better to be of Central Park West than of Central Park. Um, but really, such amazing history. So, um, so thank you, and let me turn this over to you. Thank you so much. It's such a, a thrill to be here and talk about my family before a genealogical society. Uh, definitely uh, not anything I'd ever uh, considered doing before. Um, I, uh, this book took a very, very long time to write and, and sort out what it was going to be, um, in part because uh, I'm not a, a biographer. And uh, my first attempts at doing this were, were very boring. Uh, I, I really was bored by my own book, which is a problem. 
um, until I figured out that this was not, in fact, a, a dual biography. It's a dual portrait, uh, which means you very much are getting my take on, on this story and on these two guys. Um, so I thought uh, if we, uh, Courtney, if we want to start the old slideshow, um, we would uh, begin with this uh, photo here of Herman, uh, who's there with uh, the cigar in his mouth, uh, and my grandmother, Goma, who Ben and I called her Goma on the left with the hat. Uh, and he's there in Coney Island with his friend Ben Hecht and his wife Rose in about uh, 1926. And, um, and Ben Hecht is actually the one who called Herman the Voltaire of Central Park West. And he's also the one who uh, is sort of responsible for the book's title. Uh, the title is Competing with Idiots, and that uh, comes from a famous telegram that uh, Herman sent back to Ben Hecht when he first got out to Hollywood in uh, late 26. He sent him a telegram that said, will you accept 300 per week to work for Paramount Pictures? All expenses paid. The 300 is peanuts. Millions are to be grabbed out here, and your only competition is idiots. Don't let this get around. And so that's that's the the where I got the title, um, and and that is really the theme. It's it's competition, uh, and what it does to people, and what it means to think that you're better than everybody else. Um, and the competition at the heart of the book uh, really is a, 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 if you will, a Cain and Abel story. Uh, is Herman and his brother Joe. So. The boring book that I was originally writing, uh, I, will, I will say, uh, okay, well, who is Herman Mankiewicz? Uh, next slide, please. Well, Herman Mankiewicz was a uh, larger than life screenwriter uh, in Hollywood. Uh, one of the first New York screenwriters to go, uh, New York writers to go out there uh, and, and sort of lead, led the way when he sent that telegram to Ben Hecht it started the flood of New York writers out to Hollywood. And before long, they were all out there. Most of them thought the work was beneath them uh, and that they would soon be getting back to their real work, whether it's novels or plays or journalism. So that's Herman Mankiewicz. And he was incredibly funny. He, everything he said was a brilliant one-liner and he lived this sort of larger than life, Voltaire of Central Park West kind of life. Uh, so much so that, in fact, uh, he became the subject of uh, David Fincher's movie a year ago, uh, Mank, starring Gary Oldman. So that, and that's what he lived his life for, in order to be talked about, in order to be a kind of legend. Even more, I think, than wanting to be a great writer, he wanted to live a great, talked about, legendary life. His younger brother, Joe, on the other hand, 11 and a half or 12 years younger, slide please, uh, is, is, you know, in, in the history books, he is a successful Hollywood director. Um, and he started uh, in Hollywood in the late 20s. Uh, he came out uh, also because of a telegram from Herman, although this one just said, for Christ's sake, come to Hollywood, when Joe graduated from Columbia at the age of 19 and bummed around Europe for about six months without knowing what he wanted to do with his life. Uh, he got out to Hollywood, became uh, for a time a, a, a writer, and then worked his way up. He became a producer. You have to walk before you can uh, before you can run, Louis B. Mayer told him. And he became a very successful producer. He then became a very successful writer-director and really reached the, the peak of his career, uh, winning Oscars for best writing and best directing back-to-back -back years uh, in uh, for, for Letter to Three Wives and All About Eve, his masterpiece. Um, and he stayed at the top of the Hollywood game throughout the 50s. Um, and, and, you know, his career fell off after Cleopatra, but he went out. Uh, his final film, Sleuth, in 1972, was also a very successful uh, film. So that's who they were, you know, if, 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 if this is just a boring biography, that's who they were. Um, and I'm not saying it's not a boring biography, but it, <laughs> that's not the one I wrote. Uh, the portrait is, okay, yeah, but what did I know about these two guys? Well, next slide, please. Um, Herman was the funniest, greatest, warmest, most amazing man who ever lived, who wrote Citizen Kane, the greatest movie ever made with Orson Welles. That's what I grew up thinking. Um, when I have no memory of not knowing that my grandfather wrote the greatest movie of all time. And oh, by the way, 
He was also self-destructive and drank himself into an early grave and died 12 years before you, Nikki, were born. Uh, but he was great. Oh my God, he was so warm and larger than life. Just a terrific, wonderful, warm, fabulous guy. That's my grandfather. Okay. And then who is this Uncle Joe? Next slide, please. Uh, well, Joe, we don't see Joe very much when I'm growing up. Um, and in fact, I, when I was seven, eight, nine years old, I assumed that was because he was responsible for what I was told was the biggest bomb in movie history, Cleopatra. And so I imagined that, well, Joe is just living with this enormous shame because that's, that's his legacy. And, and well, that's just horrible. That's what it, I, I, no wonder we don't see him. And, and he lives only an hour away from us when I was growing up. Then, since this is a, a um, now, now where do I get this idea? I, I get this idea, next slide, uh, from Herman's only daughter. Herman had two sons, uh, Don and Frank. Uh, and Frank was uh, Ben's father, and uh, who's going to be joining us later, Ben. Um, and that's my mom, uh, Johanna Mankiewicz, who was born in 1937. And um, so she's the one who told me all this. Um, and she was a very cute two-year-old there. And Herman seems to really love her. And I think he really did love her. Um, unfortunately, she grew up uh, with, without a father because he died when she was 15. Um, but interestingly enough, um, within uh, almost exactly 20 years of this photo being taken, the next photo uh, we'll see, slide please, uh, is of Herman and, uh, excuse me, Joe and my mom on her wedding day when she's marrying my father, um, Peter Davis, in uh, September of 1959 at the agent Sam Jaffe's house. Um, and the what is interesting, you know, if you just come at this from the point of view of, wait a minute, we don't see Uncle Joe, I don't get it, wait, but he's walking her down the aisle. He was a great, he was, he's my great uncle, but he was a great uncle to her. Um, and after Herman died in 1953, in fact, Joe put her through college and sent her on a Europe trip and really looked out for her. And so it's not nearly as sort of cut and dry as, as I thought when I was a kid. Now, part of the reason my uh, thinking on all this didn't evolve that much uh, was because unfortunately, sadly, tragically, my mom herself died uh, in 1974 at the age of 36 when I was nine. So these ideas of Herman, greatest guy who ever lived, funniest man who ever lived, drank himself into an early grave, but don't pay attention to that part of the story, wrote the best movie of all time, and Joe, bomb movie director, those got frozen in my mind, uh, these sort of cartoon images. And so I set out on this. Um, I set out on this this process of writing this book because I wanted to figure out who, in fact, they really were uh, underneath these cartoons. And you know, the other thing that I knew. Next slide, please. Is is you know, Herman was always the guy. Like when I was growing up, it was it was always about Herman. He had, this is a, a photo of Herman uh, when he was seven years old in New York City. And um, one of the things I liked about this photo, next slide please, is that guy Herman looks a little bit like this guy over there on the right. Uh, let's go back and see Herman again. Now, you know, uh, reasonable people can disagree as to whether or not this likeness is, is real or not. Let's go back to me and mom. Um, but I certainly was told, oh yeah, you look like Herman. Oh, and I was thrilled. Oh my God, I look like Herman, the funniest man who ever lived. And he wrote the greatest movie of all time. Oh my God. And he drank himself into an early, well, hmm, drank himself into an early grave. Maybe I don't do that part, but, uh, and oh, and he hated what he did and he thought his work was beneath him. Huh, well, this is an interesting legacy. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, so that's kind of where I was uh, when I was a very young man in 1988. Next slide, please. I get out of college um, and my father, knowing that I have no idea what to do with my life, calls me up and says, hey, they're honoring your Uncle Joe at uh, the French consulate. Do uh, you want to come along? And I thought, I don't understand. But he, I thought he was just responsible for the biggest bomb in Hollywood. Sure, okay. 
I mean, I'd heard of all about Eve and I, I think I'd even seen it and thought, oh, this is pretty good. Uh, very arrogant dismissal of the rest of his work and probably of all about Eve as well. Um, but I go along to the French embassy and, and he's great. He wins this, they give him a thing, he hangs it around his neck. He introduces me to Claudette Colbert. I had not seen him since my mom's funeral. And it, he was warm and self-deprecating and lovely. And he patted my hand and his, he was just lovely. And he reminded me, actually, uh, let's go to the next slide. He, he reminded me of my uncle Frank, who was my favorite uncle. That, that pops on the screen and I think I'm looking at my uncle Frank. That's, but that's not, that's Joe. And I kind of thought, well, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand how we didn't see this guy. Like, wh what is the story here? What, why are these two figures leaving, leading their lives in such a way so that we don't even, I don't even know this, other, this, this man, Joe Mankiewicz, and I'd like to get to know him. So um, now a lot of this has to do with competition. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And um, the fact that these two guys were competing so fiercely with each other. And that's because of, and you see there, this is Joe's mantle with the four Oscars. Uh, but the real pride of place is held by uh, the portrait of Franz Mankiewicz. And Franz Mankiewicz, uh, you know, was the, the meanest, <laughs> most, you know, severe disciplinarian that you could ever have for a father. Nothing you do can satisfy this man. Uh, you bring home a 97 on a test, where are the other three points? And it's not funny, you know, I mean, you can imagine that being said with humor, but it really is, no, what happened? And um, nothing short of perfection will do, and you have to do your best. And Herman said, you know, uh, if you're with a father like that, eventually you're just gonna say, stick it, I, I, I'm not even gonna try. Um, next slide, please. So the, the idea of ever getting love from that man, it's just never gonna happen. And in fact, you know, once, uh, you know, through Franz's, uh, well, cruelty or punishment or something, uh, Franz allowed Herman to lose his childhood bicycle, uh, which became the inspiration for Rosebud in Citizen Kane. Um, and it, it has to do with the impossibility of ever attaining parental love, which is at the core of Citizen Kane, Herman's greatest masterpiece and is also at the core of, of Herman's life when you have a father like that. Um, and the, the idea of, let's go to the next slide, the idea that, that, that winning an award or being professionally successful uh, can ever really satisfy you, uh, it's, it's, you know, that, that's a man who is um, at that point 44 years old, I think, if that, he doesn't look 44. Um, you know, Gary Oldman was 62 and, and he looked totally fine. He looked as old, if not uh, younger than Herman at that point in his life. Um, by the time he died, there are pictures of him taken towards the end of his life. He looks 75 or 80 and he's 55. I actually recently uh, passed the Herman Mankiewicz milestone of I'm now older than Herman ever was. Um, and you know, an Oscar is, is, is no consolation when you don't feel good about yourself or what you're doing. Um, the great tragedy of, of Herman's life really is that he was writing some of the best movies uh, of the golden age, he working on them, and he thought the work was beneath him, was, was crap. Um, let's go to the next slide. And, and th this idea of awards not being all that meaningful is also at the core of Joe's greatest work, uh, all about Eve. And in fact, there's that great line when uh, Betty Davis says to Eve, uh, you know, uh, you can always stick that award where your heart ought to be. Um, in other words, Eve Harrington has no heart. Now, um, the last thing I will say about All About Eve, it is unquestionably a masterpiece and it's, I think, Joe's, you know, best, best movie. And what is it about? It is about a younger artist who is taking down an older artist, uh, younger, colder, calculating, ambitious, going for what she wants and, and taking it from the older, self-destructive, larger than life, far more charismatic figure of Betty Davis, uh, Margot Channing, the character. Well, it's my belief and, and um, 
uh, that, that that is in fact all about Eve is an emotional autobiography on, on Joe's part and that he was drawing on Joe, uh, his relationship with Herman when he wrote it. Um, I, I, the, one of the great regrets of, of the book and of my life is that I couldn't talk to Joe about this because he poo-pooed this idea. He said Herman had nothing to do with it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, the, writing this book in, has given me a chance to get to know these guys, um, but so has the recent uh, discovery of a clip uh, that we're now going to show, uh, which is the only footage I've ever seen of Herman Mankiewicz. And I think it's the only footage uh, that the other Herman Mankiewicz grandson has ever seen of Herman Mankiewicz. Uh, so we'll play this uh, little 29 seconds of Herman Mankiewicz, uh, a home movies from Catalina Island in 1935. Um, a bunch of Hollywood guys are just, you know, palling around on a boat. Uh, and uh, he, let, let's play this. You'll you'll get to see Herman. And then on the other side of this clip, we'll we'll get to see uh, my cousin Ben. And that's Herman there with the belly. And the other people are, are screenwriters and also a producer and a, a makeup artist. And that's it. That, that, that's, that's as close as we've ever come to footage of Herman Mankiewicz. And now let me introduce my favorite cousin, Ben Mankiewicz, TCM's dashing, suave, and sophisticated host. Ben? Hello, Nick. How are you? Hello, Ben. How are you? Uh, I think it's about 22 uh, seconds uh, too much of Herman. <laughs> it was, uh, I just thought it dragged a little bit in the second act. Um, yeah, there's not uh, much to the second act. I just like seeing him smoke a cigarette. No, this, 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 it was, no, it was great to, uh, it's great to see. It's amazing to think that you our ages uh, and that I was just looking. I Because, yeah, Herman was uh, like 55 and what, four months when he died, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'll be uh, I'll be passing that milestone uh, shortly. Great. We'll have a party. Yeah. But it's something, man, to think because he looked uh, it's a do. Yeah. I mean, it, it is it is different. Um, uh, so uh, congratulations, by the way, on the book. Uh, and and uh, thank you very much. And a, and a very nice uh, presentation there. You know, I, I don't know. Is it possible if it is? Because I just throw this out. My brother Josh Michael is, is a course also obviously next cousin correspondent for Dateline NBC. And I wondered if they might be able to put that photo back up that, that you just had. I think it was the last photo from the set, all about Eve with the uh, with Joe and, and Celeste Holm and Ann Baxter and Betty Davis, um, which is on page two hundred and sixteen there in uh, in uh, in Nick's book. Um, that is definitely not it. Um, but uh, uh, if that picture can be found and it's not the end of the world, if it can't, um, uh, Joe in that photo, I mean, we really do. There is a quality. Yeah. He looks like Josh a lot yeah, he does. like Josh. Yeah, and I don't yeah. like Josh. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, which is, uh, you know, again, it's nice. It's nice. And you do look like Herman in that photo with you and uh, uh, with you and your mom. Um, so I thought to start because you, you talked about, you know, obviously the, you know, taken from, uh, from the telegram to Ben Heck, the title of the book competing with, with idiots. I wondered if you might just go to page 303 Nick, of your, uh, of your book. And, uh, so our cousin, Tom Mankiewicz, Joe's son, oldest, who's older, Chris or Tom, Nick, I forgot. Uh, I always forget Chris, even though Tom is more seems mature, Tom yeah. seemed like the older one. But uh, so Chris, uh, so Tom died in 2010. Is that right? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and Tom had a, a really what can only be described as an unbelievably successful uh, Hollywood uh, career. I mean, he, he created uh, Heart to Heart, was the showrunner anyway, on, on Heart to Heart for a long time, which is what got him his nice uh, house in, in, in Beverly Hills. And uh uh, he wrote, uh, he credited as the screenwriter, I think, on three James Bond movies, but he, he worked on, I think, five Bond movies, yeah. something like that. And, and Superman. Don't wrote forget Superman. Superman one and yeah. two. Right. You know, yeah. and and uh, for for Dick Donner. And 
a directed movie. I mean, it's just that's a successful life. Oh, and and really yeah. was the first like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, massively among the first massively overpaid consultants. I mean, t- Chris, yeah. Tom would get like here, Tom, uh, f- over the weekend, here's one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. This scene doesn't work. It's eight right. pages. Can you fix it? Yeah. Fix this scene in legal eagles. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Fix this scene in legal eagles. And there's eighty five thousand dollars. We need to buy tomorrow. <laughs> right. I mean, that's a, it was a good life. So you write about what happened when Tom died of uh, pancreatic cancer and because uh, he drank and, and smoked a lot and smoked a lot. What happened when he died in, in 2010? What's that? What's that obit? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, so there was an obit that said, um, you know, it, it, it started uh, with Tom Hankwood's successful thing, but his accomplishments paled next to those of his uh, father, Joe Mankiewicz, who, you know, did all about even. And it was just sort of like, wait, you're going to actually do this in, a, in an obit? And the next sentence was, but even Joe's accomplishments paled to the legend of his brother, Herman Mankiewicz. And it's just like the competition is just goes on and on and on. Uh, even Joe Mankiewicz remains overshadowed by Herman Mankiewicz, Tom's uncle, who co-wrote Citizen Kane with Orson Welles. And, and, you know, I think what I took from that, I found it very depressing. I mean, I found that a very upsetting sort of like, really, is that all it's going to be? And that goes on forever, you know. And then Herman, of course, is nothing next to Wells, and Wells is nothing next to Mozart. And Mozart is nothing next to Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is <laughs> nothing next to Jesus. I mean, you know, it's just like, it's just silly. Um, so yeah, it, I, I, I was really struck by that. I th- you know, there's a, I don't know if it's a tendency of us as, as Mankiewicz's or, I, but I think it's really, you know, it, it's human. Uh, our cynicism creeps out and there's a lot of it uh, uh, in the, in the family. Um, but this notion that, that again, not to celebrate what is worth celebrating because they're, are things that other people did that's better, right? Right. And Why it, what, focus? Let's focus on the missing three points rather than the ninety-seven positive points. You know. Yeah. Like, right. I mean, again, and that's a, it, it is. It is a a bit. It captures that obit in the London paper. Captures some of what it is to be a Mankiewicz and this fear. I mean, it's mostly great. Obviously, we're not going to sit here and talk about that. It's been a burden but it has some burdensome components to it. And for me, not having a father in entertainment, you know, my dad had just, he did, I mean, he, I think, recognized what it was gonna be to be Herman Mankiewicz's son and Joe Mankiewicz's nephew. And, you know, you, as you kindly point out in, my, in, in, in your book, my dad is a brilliant guy and would have been a great screenwriter. Great, great, legendary screenwriter. He wanted no part of it and got into politics. But my whole life, I thought every room I was in, my dad was the smartest guy in the room. And everybody laughed at everything he said. And everybody called him for advice about everything, right? Yeah. yeah. He was so nice to everybody, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm never going to, in a billion years, have yeah. that kind of life, that kind of career, right? right? That right. kind of success. Right. Yeah. And, 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 but what is, what was value? You know, I mean, we actually haven't talked about this and maybe we can do this offline, but, you know, what was valued in the homes of these people? And it does seem like Herman did not value success in the movie business that much. He never talked about, uh, you know, he, he didn't bring the work home at all. He was interested in ideas and politics and what was going on in the world. He didn't come home and complain about, you know, Louis B. Mayer or talk office politics. In part, that's sad because the work was, but he felt the work was beneath him and he should have been doing something else. But in part, it was like, well, no, values are things like being smart, being an intelligent person and in a citizen of the world and, and, and having a good family life. That was what Herman valued and what I think his children valued. Um, I don't get the sense that Frank Mankiewicz, your father, not the original Franz, uh, you know, was castigating you if you brought home a 97. I mean, frankly, man, if you brought home a 97. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did they grade it wrong? What's yeah. No, it would never occur to my dad to say what happened to the other three points. Right. You know? Right. If you're like, who'd you cheat off? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I the the part, I mean, uh, mo- partly because you you quote the dad so uh, much in it, but the 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 about Herman at home, 
and was that substantively different than Joe? Who did yes. Joe? I mean, Joe left Hollywood. I mean, Joe moved to New York, but 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 it was different. Joe did talk about the business. Yeah. Yes, and he was cons- Joe was consumed by work and career, and and even though he did, you know, he also thought Hollywood was a horrible ivory ghetto and got out as quickly as he could and made his escape right when he was at the top of the game, which was terrific, and then was very successful in New York in the fifties as a movie maker. But he was there because he thought, oh, now I can really write my play. You know, like I'll write a play and that'll be the thing that proves to the father figure in my imagination, because by then Franz is dead, uh, you know, that I'm really worth something. And um, so but he was consumed by work. He wasn't like, well, Chris, Tom, uh, tell me about their day and who said what to whom, Uh, you know, like there, there was none of that. So I I was struck by, you know, and I've heard you tell the story before and you tell it really well. But the, the, that early notion, and you told it here today, that the, of your, your impression of Joe is that Herman was the life of the party, the smartest guy in the room, funny as hell. It doesn't matter that he drank himself to death. He wrote the greatest movie ever. Joe is responsible for the biggest failure ever, right? Period. Even though right. one guy had four Oscars, right? So um, yeah, there were there were there were problems with this cartoon. Yeah, right. The narrative the narrative needed to be reworked, but nonetheless, then so you. So and you were because you're a thoughtful person and cares about the world around you and your family, you were like, well, when it occurred to you that that was wrong, you wanted to investigate it. But then you had the same sort of moment. Then you then you also then get to a moment where you marginalize Herman. Right. And I I mean, I just think it to which prompted that 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 conversation with my father, which also contributed. Yeah. So tell us. Yeah, because it's easy to fall into, you know, well, Herman was uh, the funniest man who ever lived and he fell down drunk and uh, drank himself into an early grave. We're done, you know, and and I did, so I, I was the, the book really, I mean, there's so many geneses for these bo- this book. I mean, I've been sort of thinking about it my whole life, clearly, but there was a point where um uh, I was, I did an interview and, and talk and they always want to know, Oh, you come from this. And I was like, well, yeah, yeah. And I tossed off a couple of lines and, and your, your dad called me when the interview appeared and he said, you know, you make my dad sound a little bit like Foster Brooks. I mean, <laughs> he was a pretty substantial guy and you didn't know him. And I thought, yeah, it's true. I, he, he was a complicated, fascinating, wonderful, tortured. Yes but complex man, you know, not, not just like, well, the white wine came up with the fish, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, or, uh, I, I mean, I there's just, so many great Herman Mankiewicz stories. That's the problem. He's so funny. And there's so many great stories that you could just t- sit, you know, sit around telling funny Herman Mankiewicz stories. Um, you know, imagine the whole world wired to Harry Cohn's ass. Oh, Herman, you know, but, but, but there's more there. There's a lot of substance and heart. I just wondered if that, I mean, cause I, I, in, you know, both your, the simplistic impression of Joe and then sort of replaced, I mean, it suited you for an interview and I'm not, I don't mean to overstate it, but then a simplistic version of Herman, which I, I'm responsible for both of these things too. There's a lesson there, man, because we do it all the time yeah. about other people. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, we're doing it a little bit you are doing it and i've participated in it greatly about france right because now we find like yes. we just, right now yes. we're marginalizing france right yeah, no and, and the way i talked about france just 10 minutes ago i felt like now I, let's come i'm glad you brought that up because people come to me having read the book they go oh, france real asshole and i'm like well yes and no i mean he loved his kids he, in his way for that time for a german immigrant that's the way you parented um, but I, I believe that he loved them dearly. And, and, you know, there are funny stories about Franz just not getting it. Um, or, but there's also stories of him, you know, he didn't care about movies, but he would pay his money and go to the movies and watch his son's name come on the screen and then leave. Like he, that he was proud of them. He didn't get it. He didn't understand it. It wasn't meaningful to him what they did but he was certainly proud and he did love them and so when people say boy that guy was a real jerk i do think ah, maybe i didn't in the book paint him in his full uh, uh, uh because he was so dominant and scared the shit out of his kids you know that that that's that's what i 
took from it. But I also think that, you know, there's something to be said for Franz. And, and there's even a picture of him in the book where he's a young man in New York and he actually, he doesn't, uh, here's a little, you know, inside publishing, like he doesn't look that mean. He, he, <laughs> he looks like a sort of nice guy. And I, I saw the photo when the galleys came back and I was like, can you guys adjust the contrast and you know, <laughs> make it look a little darker? He looks kind of nice. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, we hear both of us have heard from students of his, right, who took classes yeah. from him, and they were yeah. mo mostly. It's like, oh, what a, what a teacher, what great a teacher. teacher, right? Great, great, teacher. Te great, sensitive teacher, and encouraged me to follow, you know, my what I care most about and everything. Yeah, no, I mean, there's there's terrific, terrific just, stuff. I mean, I, I, I this is I guess trite, but the lesson is that our takes which we are filled with in this world, um, they're all wrong, right? I mean, are they're all, most of them are, are certainly not flushed out. No, right? and they're all yeah. oversimplifications because we're all selling something all the time. And so you have to sell. And like, well, all right, I'm gonna sell this guy. He's the mean father and he's, you know, three point, the missing three point. Well, in fact, yeah, but he, he's a poet. He was 17 years old, he was a poet. He comes to America to make his living as a poet. Well, I mean, what must that have felt like when you get off the boat, you can't speak the English language and you realize, so what was the idea here? I was going to make right. it as a poet? Right. Exactly. I don't know what rhymes. Uh, sorry, Franz. Uh, yeah. I mean, and then the dreams get crushed and you next thing you know, you got kids and a family and you're doing anything you can to put food on the table. I, I, um, I didn't. Uh, is that in the book? I missed it or forgot it. Very, I mean, very late in the book. I reveal that Joe, that, that Joe, it, there's a great interview, a great documentary about Joe that's online done by a French company. And um, and he says, yeah, my father was he wanted to be a poet. I mean, yeah, but also the 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 watching the movies and leaving. I mean, that like if yeah. the boys had oh, that known that. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, if they'd known, I mean, if they'd known not just that fact, but what went, I mean, you say he was clearly proud of his kids. You, you don't go to the movie and watch for the credit and then leave unless you proud of your kids. Yeah. Right. You just, and, and unless you're kind of only proud of your kids. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> like, so you're certainly not there because you want to see the movie. Right. Clearly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, they didn't know that or it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't reach them in a meaningful way. Well, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, we, we've had this conversation before. I mean, so when Franz was dying uh, in the hospital, Herman, uh, you know, took the whole week off from the studio, which was probably not the greatest, you know, uh, sacrifice on his part, um, and sat by his bed and held his hand and, you know, was, was there for him. And Joe came once, stayed half an hour and left. And, and you could look at that and think, God, Joe, man, it's so cold, you know, or you could say, Joe thought, well, you, you, I mean, say what you, you, you're feeling about it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I know, and I know some of it comes out of therapy, you know, that when your, your aunt, my mother had got sick, she had Alzheimer's, she died in 2019, a little before the pandemic. My brother and I, my brother and I are very close, but we, and our relationship with our mother is very different. His was actually better for longer before neither of us had that great a relationship with her. And mine was a little more challenging and I bore the brunt of my parents' divorce in a way that mom didn't handle very well. And, but then I spent more time with her when she had Alzheimer's and he didn't. And, you know, and my therapist kept saying, yeah, your brother's doing it fine. You know, like, don't do what he's doing. You don't mm. like you do what you can do. It doesn't right. make you go crazy. Yeah. So and you, you can't get blood from a stone. That's so. right. So so in a sense, Joe probably handled it better. And in fact, yeah. Joe in general, I mean, he had his flaws, but Joe handled life better. Right. I mean, Herman drank and gambled and died. Well, yeah, yeah, but Joe had uh, two very, very unsuccessful marriages before. I, you I, know. I got it. Joe managed. Uh, I yeah. mean, ultimately, I think you have to give Joe managing life better. He got 28 more years out of it. I mean, he did not <laughs> totally sell. Yes, he had two very flawed marriages and then yeah. one really good one. Yeah. On the other hand, it's not a competition, you know. <laughs> And I mean, it's, is it, is it, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we're getting pinged by the chat box that I, oh. I suppose we're supposed to bring. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's uh, bring uh, uh, one of the uh, best uh, film critics. By the way, I'm not a film critic. I need to make sure that's not in my uh, <laughs> my bio anymore. Ty Burr is a film critic. Uh, Ty, hi. Hey, hey, Ben. How you doing? Nice to see you again. Nice to see um, you too. I could listen to you guys go on about family for uh, another couple of hours. This has been really enjoyable. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, I have some questions. I'm, I'm just curious, listening to this, is there something in um, show business or Hollywood that just makes for especially gnarly family rivalries to just to to take root? And you know, I'm thinking, of, you know, I'm thinking about the brothers here. I'm thinking about Olivia de Havilland and Joan Fontaine. I'm thinking about all these sort of storied Hollywood um, family rivalries or vice versa or something in family rivalries that just draws them to show business. That's a great question. I don't, I don't know. I'm fascinated by Hollywood families and, and, and especially, you know, those that have, I mean, you know, I was reading about the Douglases recently. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the Douglas family and, and the Fondas have had a very storied, fascinating uh, history. I don't know that it's any stranger than than families in the salad dressing business or the any other business, but um, but because what they're dealing with is storytelling, maybe there's and they're they're people of drama. You know, maybe maybe it's a little bit more. I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I think it probably isn't. Um, but the the ones that are where there are these, you know, uh, certainly note noteworthy rivalries like De Havilland and 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 Joan Fontaine, uh, and to some extent like the Mankiewiczes. You know, again, we made movies; we weren't in the movies. It's a significant difference, but. They also things are better. Like, I mean, and, and by the way, they're better for Olivia de Havilland's kids and Joan Fontaine's kids. Their daughters get along great, um, which is nice. Right. And, uh, and we are trying to book them for TCM. Like, it'd be great to, to have them together. Uh, by the way, our uncle Don Mankiewicz, uh, 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 both of our uncles, uh, uh, John Mankiewicz, John and Jane Mankiewicz's dad, uh, uh, he liked to talk about Joan Fontaine. <laughs> Um, he would he would often bring up Joan Fontaine. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I will say, though, that this notion of the rivalries in the family, you know, I I mean, Nick and Tim, you guys get along pretty well. And uh, my brother and I are really close. Well, I think I think when you come from it and when it's sort of when you have that competition rattling around and it's something that you talk about, I, I feel like our generation has done a much better job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, you know, my, uh, my daughter, who's named Josie for Nick's mom, and, uh, you know, John and, and his wife, Katie, or, or her godparents, we see them all the time. Katie Mankiewicz is married to John Mankiewicz. Don's son is, uh, you know, she's done a, this yeoman's work of forcing this family together. And the result is it worked. Like, yeah. it's yeah. fun. I, I, you know, I love Nick. I love Tim. I love John. I love Katie. It's great. I love Kate. Yeah. I love John and Katie's kids, you know, uh, yeah. Molly and, and Jack. So, you know, it's nice. It's nice. It's nice to be able to, to yeah. be closer anyway than, than although my dad and your mom were, were extremely close. They were very close too. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think they, I mean, and, 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 and Don and Frank were close. Yeah. And they're in their own way. They, yes, they, they, yeah. they definitely were. Yeah. It wasn't a lot of hugging, but yeah, no, not a lot of hugging, but there was a lot of talking. Yeah. Um, there's a question from the audience. Did Herman and Joe spend much time together? Did they ever collaborate despite their rivalry? They did not spend very much time together. Uh, and they spent less and less time together as things went along. They did collaborate once. There is one movie, a uh, million dollar legs, a WC Fields movie, a 64 minute just blitz of uh, wacky vaudeville and gags that kind of, it's like a Marx Brothers movie without the Marx Brothers. Uh, Joe was one of the credited screenwriters and Herman was one of the credited producers. Um, but if you asked Goma, our grandmother, uh, Herman wrote it all, <laughs> even though he was a producer. And if you ask Joe or Joe's writing partner, they wrote it all. Um, so, you know, it, but I mean, that tension was there, um, but what's, fun, I mean, it is. A really and that was early. That was not long after Joe got to Hollywood yeah. and it wouldn't have been unusual for a producer on a movie at that time to, to write it either. Yeah. I mean, especially since were, that's what her uh, was. Yeah. Loosely right. handed out. And yeah. Um, yeah, that was in about 32, I think. Well, yeah, it's about the 32. Olympics, Who came up so. with the woohoo gag. 
Yeah, you remember that that scene from the movie? It's one of my favorite movies. It, it, it's um, who knows who came up with it. I, I think. I mean, in my book, I sort of speculate, uh, sort of in a silly way, but because Herman had worked so much with the Marx Brothers, I'm giving Herman a lot of credit. <laughs> On the other hand, Joe is the one who came up with the phrase, my little chickadee for W.C. Fields. And W.C. Oh. Fields is the star of that movie. So um, I, I think they both did a great, you know, but that's the only movie they collaborated on. As Joe rose and as his career went this way and Herman's career went that way, uh, they spent less and less time together. Uh, and, and, you know, especially because, I mean, because Joe didn't, uh, Herman didn't take it seriously and Joe did. Yeah. Joe was right. like, no, yeah. this is an art form and, and a good business and let's do this. You know, you guys are just out drinking and, and you know, cackling your way into screenwriting, but I, I'm going to actually learn how this is done and do it well. Um, a lot of people are asking, um, how accurate is Mank? And I would actually like to tag on to that. How accurate is the portrayal of Joe? Uh, is portrayed by I forget the actor playing him, um, and the and the how accurate is the re the relationship portrayed? Um, Nick, you can go first. Oh, I was going to say you can go first. All right, well, I, I'll, um, I'll go first. I'll go first. Yeah. You can think about it. Your answer matters more. You're the guy. You wrote the book. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, uh, I, I was uh, incredibly moved by Mank. I mean, I started crying at the opening credits. Hmm. Um, uh, at the title card, really, I was like, "Oh my God, they really, he really made this movie." It's called Mank. For crying out loud, you know. Some people ask me if I like it. I'm like, you know, it's called Mank, and they say <laughs> the word Mank like 85 times. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Um, so, I my biggest regret about Mank was that my dad didn't see it because I think he would have loved it. And so, what are you asking? What the, the nature of all the people who ask is it accurate? I mean all the things didn't happen in it. The Herman and Joe's participation in the governor's race that that didn't happen, but politics mattered a great deal in the family. And Nick mentioned that, that Herman never talked about the business when he was home. They talked about politics. They talked about the world. They talked about literature. They talked politics mattered a lot. So and in some sense, it's good that that's in there because it gives you a sense of how important that was in their lives. I, the reason I wanted my dad to have seen it was because it was like Fincher had talked to my father, which David Fincher, the director, and his dad wrote it, and and uh, Jack Fincher, and and uh, uh, it was as if Fincher had talked to my father because that is exactly how my father described Herman. So that's what was correct. So to me, was it accurate? Yeah. If you watch that movie, you have a sense of what Herman Mankiewicz was like, like and what his life was like, and the self-destructive nature of it. Did the all the events happen? Does they? No, nah, of course not. All right. Well, look, I have a, a, a very complicated, uh, it, it, this simple answer for me is I agree with everything anyone says about the movie. So I agree with everything Ben says, but if someone came and said, uh, well, it was someone's grandfather, but it wasn't mine. I would say, yeah, that's true. Uh, he didn't capture, he, he was warm, he was wise, he was funny. It's an incredibly moving and terrific performance by Gary Oldman, but that's not Herman Mankiewicz. Like it, there, there was something essential that he didn't get and that the movie didn't get. Um, but I love the fact of the movie, same as Ben. I mean, I, the, the fact that they made a movie about, your, I mean, if they made a movie about your grandfather, Ty, I mean, you'd be like, oh my God, I made a movie about my grandfather, this is great. And and now Herman Mankiewicz gets to join the national conversation. And oh, by the way, I've been working on this book for two decades. And, and now the movie is like a, a promo and people will know who this guy I'm writing about is. That's pretty good. Uh, that's, a, that's a side benefit for taking uh, two decades to finish a book. Um, so um, so I, I love the fact of it. And, and it's very hard to complain when he is portrayed as a sort of you know, sozzled Bugs Bunny meets William Shakespeare meets Oscar Schindler. I mean, it was like a superhero out of Herman, uh, what they did for him. Um, was it dramatically inert? Did it not make any sense for him to have handed in the screenplay and stayed out in Victorville? Yes, okay, that's, that's true. Was the whole thing kind of overly controlled and sort of airless? And, and was it missing the essential Jewish improvisational nature of the Citizen Kane script and Hollywood in the late 30s? Yes, but I'm not here to say that. 
and you just did. Um, and 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 is is Joe? Do you feel like Joe's accurately portrayed, or not? Yes, I felt like in some ways, yes. I, to be honest, I, I I really felt an absence of Jewishness in the film, um, and 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 that's a weird sort of thing that maybe would get me canceled for even saying it. So I didn't say it, but but I I I didn't feel like there was enough. Um, emotional accessibility in 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 Joe uh, in Joe's character. I, I believe that part of the screenplay. I'm sure, and and I know Joe knew it was the best thing Herman ever did. Um, but I actually think that they also didn't quite capture Joe's competitive nature. Well, you know, I I thought I don't I don't know the answer to that question. I know my answer is really based on the essence of Herman that I thought dad would have thought this is as good as a movie could get for a guy who's been dead at that point you know 57 years right um who's there's no well apparently there is 29 seconds but there's no there's no movie footage of you know and so i thought that 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 my dad would think that that they captured it that's a weird time in joe's life because he hadn't made it yet to the way that people knew Joe Mankiewicz. He was succeeding and would then have an amazing decade in the forties and into the fifties. But, and, and I thought he was my, I was, you know, had been told ahead of time by those who'd read the script that Joe gets hammered in it. But I, I didn't, I didn't find that that was true. I thought Joe was rather sympathetic that he was. The I thought he was very out. sympathetic. Yeah, I thought, I thought was, that yeah. the, the, the other one issue I had is he called Herman Mank. And I, yeah, I don't, I don't that's... think that happened um, because Joe was himself Mank. Uh, that's so right. Yeah. That, that seemed a little odd. And I just, I didn't quite feel the ambition on Joe's, Joe's part. But I thought that actor was great. And he um, was Tom, in... Tom Pelfrey. But right. Joe. Right. And and Wells was great. I mean, if we're just, yep. I mean, they were. They, Amanda Seyfried was fantastic. She was really great. Yeah. yeah she yeah. was great. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. I want to ask uh, to both of you, uh, can you name one movie each by um, Herman and one by Joe that you feel is sort of unfairly overlooked that people should keep an eye out on? I mean, we know that we know the famous ones, um, but, but they made so many movies. They both worked on so many movies. What, 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 what's the unknown gem? Well, for Joe, I love Five Fingers, uh, James Mason, uh, sort of sort of Hitchcockian film, and I feel like it always gets overlooked. Um, but it's it's really weird and and suspenseful, and James Mason is great, and and it just doesn't get talked about very much, and I'm not sure why. Um, and I don't know that I mean it's hard for me to think about Herman's work in terms of what's overlooked because. I mean, like my dear Miss Aldrich is sort of rightfully overlooked, but I'm I think it's fun. And 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 Pride of the Yankees is I don't think overlooked and is great. So I, you know, is it I, I don't know. Those are the two that I always go to other than Citizen Kane, which is a masterpiece that you could watch once a week for the rest of your life and, and keep getting things out of. Yeah, I would say just that for, for you know to, to Herman, some of the, if anything's overlooked, it would be, and I don't really know the extent of his participation because a little bit like W. C. Fields, you know, I, I imagine, you know, Fields writes some. I mean, he's W. C. Fields. He's a you know quintessential performer. I don't know how much writing you do for him that you get credit for, um, right. but uh, but Herman's contributions on the Marx Brothers and some of their best movies is really significant and i would like that to be appreciated uh, i think nick writes about it in, in in the book too i would say an overlooked uh, movie of joe's that is easily uh, uh uh dismissed because of the crazy accents uh is is house of strangers uh yeah. which i think is yeah. a really which is a nice actually a, a, yeah. a really nice move and the other thing that i think i have to say at this point is cleopatra is not nearly as oh, right yeah, as totally. the reputation as its reputation especially the first half is is really interesting and and you know burton is great all the way through i i, I think cleopatra is is underrated um uh, i'm going to tell this story very briefly ty and did you get one more it's question i promise but i was at the my second first or second tcm film festival like 2011 2012 and we were honoring kirk douglas and We'd made up this little green room and uh, and I go, uh, 
uh, and I go back to meet him. I'm very nervous. I haven't had an interview like this. And he's had the stroke. It's going to be a challenging interview in front of a thousand people. But, uh, and he calls me over, uh, you know, and we're, you know, I say, Hey, I'm Ben Mango. It's nice to meet you. You know, and he goes, you know, I made a movie with your uncle. Hey, who is Joe to you? I go, my uncle. He goes, I made a movie with your uncle. And I go, yeah, no, I know. And I, I, I you know, letter to three wives. He goes, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> he goes, I made a, a Western with your uncle. Right. Um, uh, and, and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, no, I know. He said, yeah, it was, there was a crooked man. Right. And I'm like, yeah. I, I go, yeah, how was that? He goes, well, I learned one thing uh, in that movie. And again, I'm like really leaning over right next to him. And he goes, you know what I learned from that movie? I go, well, what is that? He goes, your uncle shouldn't have made a Western. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It was great. It was great. Yeah. All right. I think we, I think we're uh, we've hit the time limit, have we, um, Margaret? Yeah, it's so fascinating that um, I I think we could all sit here all evening and um, but uh, we we stick to a calendar here, a schedule. So I have learned so much, gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for this great discussion. And um, it just uh, it's like it's candy, as I said to a bunch of people today. So thank you for this candy and popcorn and all of the great things. Um, as we do for all our American Inspiration events, we've asked our guest author, Nick, to share a reading from his book. Um, Nick's picked a great passage about family. Um, thank you, for Nick, for that. And back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to this uh, event. Um, this is a passage uh, that describes uh, Joe's third wedding. Uh, and so, on December 14th, 1962, before a small crowd in front of a New York City judge, after nearly two years of shooting on Cleopatra, just two weeks before Zanuck rehired him to do the reshoots and finish the editing, and less than six months before the film opened, Joe married again. Three years after orchestrating and virtually directing the wedding of Herman's daughter, now Joe looked happy, content, even twinkly. Johanna Davis gripped the arm of her husband and watched Joe and Rosemary greet the judge with professional elan. Her uncle seemed not to care, at least for the moment, about Cleopatra, about which Joe had told his niece so many horror stories. But it's likely that Josie's mind was not on Joe's career for the moment, or for that matter, her own. As she watched Joe and Rosemary take their vows, it's hard to imagine, no matter her gratitude for all that her uncle had done for her, that she was paying careful attention. For the beam that seemed to emanate from Johanna Mankiewicz Davis that afternoon had very little to do with Joe and Rosemary and everything to do with what was happening inside her. Should she be more focused on her career? God knows that's what Joe would want if he knew, if she trusted him enough to tell him the good news. But whenever she thought about her father, she was less sure. Of course, it was practically legend how little Herman had cared about the Hollywood game, but it was deeper than that. It wasn't specific to Hollywood or movie making. It had to do with priorities or what people in other parts of the country called values. Herman Mankiewicz, yes, cared so much about achievement and accomplishment. And like all Mankiewicz's, he would forever wanna know exactly what had happened to the missing three points. But more than that, as she remembered her father, which she tried to do at least once a day, Josie Davis knew that he would be absolutely thrilled and made wildly, enormously, instantly tearful by the news of what would be arriving next summer, perhaps a month or two after Cleopatra. Herman Mankiewicz was about to become a grandfather. Thank you, Nick. You're making all of us mothers smile and grandparents too, I'm sure, um, out there. We really appreciated your family story, your insights into brotherly and cousinly rivalry, into American culture, and of course, all you three, your good humor. Um, cast, Ben and Ty, you guys were great. We are your stars all around. So really, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, just as a reminder, copies of Competing with Idiots can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, I have never laughed so hard reading a book for work. Um, it's full of wonderful stories. Uh, use the code AMINTS22 as you order online and you will receive a signed book-plated copy of the book. Thanks to our bookstore partners and also to our sponsor, tiberswatchlist.substack.com, where Ty shares film insights and also helps you pick streaming movies, uh, which is so important these days as we're all home. 
Um, we at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to present in tonight's talk. If you are looking for information on your grandfather and his coterie, a town or a time in America, you may find our research center useful. The stacks on Newbury Street are now open by appointment only, and NEHGS members can visit our digital archives anytime to gain access to 1.4 billion searchable family records. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists. You're gonna see on screen here some great educational programs coming up from the Brew Family Learning Center, including a session on researching notorious relatives, uh, true criminals, a conversation course I'm hosting on March 29, featuring two prize winning authors, historian Debbie Applegate, author of Madam, who was just on with us, and Russell Shorto, who's also been on the series. Um, his most recent book, Small Time, is about his family and the mob. Our third panelist is an NEHGS genealogist, David Allen Lampert, our senior genealogist. He is a pro at tracking people down. Uh, and save the date, um, if you could, for these other events, you literary sorts, um, join us on February 28th. We're welcoming Linda Hirschman and her new book, The Color of Abolition. The lawyer, social historian, and best-selling author will discuss the abolition as a social movement, particularly in Boston, the life work of William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Frederick Douglass, Maria Weston Chapman. She's going to be joined by Lamurchi Frazier of the Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket. The Color of Abolition has had a banner week with stellar reviews in the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And since we're talking competition here, Linda Hirschman, the author, has argued before the Supreme Court of the United States of America two times and in front of every single U.S. appellate court. So take that, Mankiewicz boys. Um, on March 8th, we'll welcome Matt Paxton, formerly host of A&E's Hoarders and current host of PBS's Legacy List with Matt Paxton. He'll share insights from his new book, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff, Declutter, Downsize, and Move Forward with Your Life. A signed copy of his book comes with your ticket. And then save the date, you naturalists and birders, uh, you will hear from Pulitzer Prize winning his, um, author, historian Jack Davis about the history of the eagle and what this icon has meant to America, to Americans over time. He'll be joined by the best loved naturalist, Scott Wiedensall, who is really a king in the birding community. Our mission at NEHGS is to educate, inspire, and connect. And we hope you'll come back for more programs. For now, from all of us behind the scenes in Boston, Providence, New York, and Hollywood, we wish you a good evening and a lovely week ahead. Winter is a great time to watch films and read books, and that's what all of us are doing here. So thanks again for joining us, and good night to everyone.